Good afternoon. You must all be sustainability leaders, being able to sustain yourself from 8.30 in the morning till now, so that's pretty cool. I don't see people sleeping yet. So when an Italian monk invented double-entry bookkeeping, what was accounting for? Was it transparency and accountability, or to be able to pay taxes more accurately? Um, probably yes, but most importantly, to avoid bankruptcy, and even more importantly, to succeed. And I would like to tell you today about why natural capital accounting may be as important as financial accounting. What's the problem you're trying to address? And I think the underlying problem is really a mindset. And a mindset that I encounter everywhere around the world. It's the same conversation. People say, as China and India are just growing through the roof, and the United States are consuming as if there was no tomorrow, what can I do? And the answer is very obvious. If you truly believe that global trends can be turned around, that they're just kind of running out <laughs> into the wild, then if you're not ready, you'll be squashed like a bug against a wall. So the question really is, if you believe that the global trends are so unmovable, if you're not ready, you're not ready. So there's a very strong case for action. And I drew this cartoon just to make that case again. I made that single-handedly, assume you're on a boat. There's a hole in the boat. You realize there's a hole in the boat. What's the reaction? Is the best reaction to say, I will not fix my boat until everybody else agrees to fix their boat first? You know, maybe a good strategy, I don't know, but um, I think there may be better ones. So what is this hole in the boat? Is it that we lack rare earth? I would say not possibly because we can always dig deeper in the planet. So perhaps it's an energy limitation. Do we need more energy to dig deeper? Do we have enough fossil fuels? Probably we have too much fossil fuels, as we heard from Tazdo as well. So the limitation really is the ability of the planet to regenerate. We call that biocapacity or we could call it farm. Life competes for, services, for surfaces. The fish I eat is not available to the pelican or to the seal, so we can add it all up. All the areas that are ecologically productive for which we compete. And indeed, how much nature do we have? How much farm do we have? Now, farms look very differently around the world, and it's not just farms, it's wetlands, it's forests, it's fisheries, the ecologically productive space on the planet, about a quarter of the planet is really highly ecologically productive. That's what we have, and what we use we call the ecological footprint. So the competition for space, for food and fibers, and for absorbing CO2, and for timber products, etc. So, in order to have good accounts, you have to have a common currency and we use what we call global hectares. So we just recognize that not every hectare is born equal. Some of them are more productive, so they're worth more global hectares. Some of them not so productive, so fewer hectares. And like that, we can build accounts. Now, the accounts that we build simply, uh, we look at all the nations around the world. We use, we extract, we mine all the data we can get from the United Nations system back from 1961 till today. So it's about 7,000 data points per country and year, and then we try to encourage others to use it. And many UN organizations have used it, the World Business Council, Sustainable Development, about 12 nations that we have worked with uh, use the ecological footprint. And not only that, then we have some ambassadors. Today we had a very nice ambassador, Ms. Leuthard, who talked about the ecological footprint. She acknowledged that we use 1.5 planets. She acknowledged that if everybody lived like Switzerland, we would take 2.8 planets that if we spread the budget over the year, right, by August we have used as many resources as Earth can regenerate within one year. So thank you, Ms. Leuthard. Uh, we have also other ambassadors, for example, La Stampa, which is a big newspaper in Italy, on their front page had this graphics saying, now, how many Italys does it take to support Italy? That's an interesting question. Uh, so suddenly people realize, wow, this has something to do 
with us. Now, when we look at the world as if the countries were farms, and in some sense they are, when I was born, most countries had far more capacity than what people in the country consumed. And within just my lifetime, we have moved to a situation where 85% of the world population lives in countries where people consume significantly more than what their ecosystems can renew. And at the global level even, we now use, as I said, about one and a half planets. Now, you may say correctly, yeah, but if you have money, you can buy the resources from somewhere else. And that's true. So Switzerland, for example, using more than what it has, may be less exposed to that risk than a country like Egypt, which also uses significantly more than what it has. And if you're interested in finding out more how much countries use, we handed out these little wallet cards. They're like credit cards, you know, so they, you can get rid of one credit card, put in a wallet card, save some money, and have some good conversations on a bus. So here you can see the, uh, where the countries are. And indeed, you can say, yeah, with money, you can shield yourself. So we made this categorization. There are really four types of countries, you could say. You can say countries either have a biocapacity and ecological deficit, that means they use more than what they have, or they have a reserve, so they would be on top. And then, if you have money, you can buy the resources. So if you have more than world average income, it's likely that in net terms, you can get stuff from the rest of the world. If you're under that, not as easy. If you now look at the distribution of the population in the world, already today, 71% of the world population live in countries that both don't have the resources, nor the money to buy the resources. That number was at 15% when I was born, at a time where there were plenty of resources in the world. So that was the limitation. So we are in a new context, and that requires new tools to help us understand how to generate success. And I would just like you to, in the rest, show you a few applications, how we can use the tool, then also how you can get engaged, because without you, we can't get anywhere. That's why it's so exciting to be here with you. For example, Switzerland, as I said, many of you may know there's only one Switzerland. It's a very deep insight, very sad, but there's only one. Uh, however, our resource demand corresponds to about four times what Swiss ecosystems can renew. How does that square with what Ms. Leuthardt said with 2.8? Because Switzerland has less biocapacity than the world as a whole, you know, so it's four Switzerlands, but 2.8 planets. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's slightly different. But so we asked this question, and we're writing a report with an economic think tank back Basel for the Swiss government to say, could there conceivably be a case that using four times more than what you have could have an implication for your competitiveness. And um, there was no agreement whether there is or not. Now, we have a certain opinion, as you may believe. Uh, we think, actually, much of the consumption that we will see over the decades to come is already baked into our infrastructure. How many tunnels we have, how many trains we have, the energy infrastructure, the houses, the way they are built, keep us on a certain track. And so, it may have an implication because the world is shifting more quickly than Swiss infrastructure. Another example from Ecuador, and I know we have the ambassador of Ecuador here, we show them the graph that showed how many Ecuadors are being used. So the upper line, the green line, is not how many Ecuadors actually, it's how many global hectares of Ecuador is there per person. And it has been dropping not because of deforestation primarily, but because there's a larger population sharing Ecuador, so the upper line is going down. The lower line of demand, ecological footprint, is slowly increasing as people consume a little bit more, and it's getting tight. So when we showed this graph first, many people in Ecuador said, are you against the right to develop? We said, not at all. We are not. We are totally for el derecho al desarrollo, as they call it. But what we see in these graphs is el derecho al colapso. <laughs> so many Ecuadorians recognize that as well, and not much later, they instituted in their development plan that they want to move out of their ecological deficit. And that was particularly interesting because it was just a few months before the Co uh, Copenhagen conference, the failed Copenhagen conference, Ecuador being a so-called Annex II country, was told by the UN to not look at its future, which I think is a bit fraudulent. Um, so they would have had to do nothing. It's not in their interest. They didn't have international pressure. We didn't bring them money. They just recognized running out of resources is not your interest. 
How interesting. So they were on the boat, they saw their hole, they didn't blame all the others. So when we look at Asia, I just was in Asia last week, very different situation, and that's what we see. We're not all in the same boat. The boats are very different. In Asia, very many countries run very significant deficits. Some of them have income to compensate for it, others more difficult. We see Vietnam as a very interesting case that through radical agricultural reforms, very much transformed by capacity. So it's, these lines are not destiny. We can manage them in the same way as we can manage income, financial income, financial expenditures, just that we do not look at these trends. Many people, because my first name is Matis, they confuse me, they say, you must be Malthus. And actually, just to make the record straight, we are anti-Malthusians. We believe we can absolutely avoid the Malthusian trap. But if we just sit back and say, oh, everything will take care of itself, then we are Malthusians. So it's absolutely possible to turn these trends. That's why we do a lot of reports. We have some reports here just to help countries and regions assess where they're at. That's the first step to understand the risk, to say, may it have an implication to use four times more than what you have, or whatever the, the number may be. If they say, yes, it has, then we can go into the assessments of what are your options? Which options are truly building wealth for you? Which options uh, may make put you in a more difficult situation? And in that, we'll be hearing from uh, Hernando de Soto, it's a very, very similar idea. Rather than in, on income, we should focus on wealth creation. Wealth is the ability to generate income in the future. And natural capital is a particularly significant part of that wealth, a non-substitutable part of that wealth that we need to take care of with priority. Now, I started as an engineer, perhaps I think a bit too mechanical for that reason, but in the end, a pilot needs to have the right information to bring the plane safely to the destination. The same thing is true for any country, for Switzerland, for example, to say, okay, what do we need to know in order to operate safely? And flying a plane is not an easy task. Lots of dials, but depending on the flight, you have to look at particular dials. And what is enormously striking to me is when you look at countries' cockpits, very, very few have a dial about What's the resource situation? Now, if you were in a plane flying for some hours and the pilot says, well, we don't need a, we don't need a fuel gauge, you wouldn't be that happy. Good, so let me now summarize. What are the new principles for success? Like with money, nature has a budget. We can find out how much nature we have and how much nature we use. I asked a class of 11-year-olds, why would we need to measure how much nature we have compared to how much we use? A girl put up her hand and said, if we eat more, no, if we use more nature than what we have, the only thing left to eat is imaginary cookies. So, <laughs> there you go, 11-year-olds, don't have to come to St. Gallen. Uh, so in that way, biocapacity becomes the currency of the 21st century. Actually, the, the, central, um, the, the central banker of Colombia told me it's not just a currency, it's the only currency backed up by reality. So I thought, that, that's interesting. But what about you? I think that's really the important point, and that's the invitation. Uh, we'd love to stay in communication with you. There are huge knowledge gaps still. We need your help. Everybody needs your help. So please explore the puzzle, how can we live well on this one planet? We don't know that yet. That's the most significant research question. I would like uh, the University of St. Gallen to say, like on the entrance door, how can we live well on X global hectares? Because the X is changing every day. Uh, engage with us, engage with others, engage in sustainability. We have internship, we look for people, other partner organizations need you. Uh, we'd love to see if we can work together with you. And um, also educate. One example of education is uh, an initiative that we actually have been able to produce thanks to Avena Foundation we call Footprint Futures, uh, which is available on our website where you can play with the idea of saying, what would be the optimal resource consumption for Ecuador? What would be the optimal one for Switzerland? There's no correct answer, but it surely keeps you thinking. So thank you so much for sustaining your interest in sustainability. And, uh, it will be a marathon, not a sprint, as you know, and I'm looking forward to be on the marathon with you. Thank you very much.